Hello everyone, my name is Madison and welcome back to Hop and Help and today I'll be teaching you how to make a custom bioactive desert enclosure. My build is going to be going to my check wallet, Jada. She's in desperate need of an upgrade, currently in a 75 and we're going to be bumping her up to an amazing 125 gallon. This tutorial, however, is not just for check wallas. Really, it works for any medium to large, arid to rocky desert reptile that you may have, including bearded dragons, check wallas, your mastics, beaded lizards, etc. Tips before we get into the video, I highly suggest watching the entire tutorial before you go out and purchase anything. Building a custom enclosure isn't hard, but it can be very time consuming and intricate, so watching the entire tutorial before you go out and purchase things or do anything to your enclosure is best so you know what you're getting into and you can make a proper plan. And most importantly, if you want to have an awesome enclosure, you have to have an awesome base. The enclosure I will be using today is from RepdiZoo. It's 125 gallon and stackable, so I will be getting another one for my Euro. But RepdiZoo really has some amazing enclosures for literally any reptile you can think of. So I highly suggest getting an enclosure from them so you have a great base to start off with. Now let's get right into the unboxing. For this being a high quality 120 gallon enclosure, it was relatively light. Now don't get me wrong, you still need two people, but it was packaged so well, there was no scratches, no concerns that even through rough shipping that this thing would be damaged. So I really appreciate that on RepiZoo's behalf. When I'm building an enclosure, I like to take everything out of the packaging and then of course read the instructions and then go from there. In the right hand upper corner, there is a link to RepiZoo's official tutorial video on how to build this enclosure, but I'll give you a little recap. You begin with the base of the glass enclosure and take the four metal rods and screw them into the designated slots. Then you're going to slide the brackets over these metal rods. Be sure that the front two rods have two slots. This is where the doors are going to be. Then comes the glass panes. This is always so satisfying. For the back glass panels, I put one in, then slid the adapter into the middle, and then slid the next pane in. And then the doors are easy enough. Put one panel in the first groove in the back, and then put the second panel in the front groove. Keep in mind when installing the sides that the glass pane with a circle in it is your cable pass, so depending on how your setup's going to look, and if you're gonna put lights within the enclosure or outside of the enclosure, kinda changes how you're gonna set that up. The cable port is very easy to put in place. It comes as one piece, so you unscrew it, and then you put it into the hole and re-screw it on. Once all the glass panes are in, you install the top cover. You just slide it right on top, then screw the screws into the top. Now before we build any part of the enclosure, it's time to clean that glass with a microfiber cloth and whatever your favorite reptile safe glass cleaner is. And then you have a beautiful enclosure built. Now for one of my favorite parts is gathering your materials. To build a custom enclosure, you need lots of unique pieces that you can make a beautiful mosaic together. Something special I wanted to incorporate for my chuckwalla is some natural slate. So I reached out to a local roofing company and they literally gave me all these broken slate tiles for free. To make custom slate pieces, you're gonna need your safety glasses on, an old towel, and a mallet. Literally all I did was kinda set up the slate on an angle with other slate and then hit it with a mallet. It breaks it into smaller pieces and then for the sharp edges, you just kinda chip away at it. But please, wear glasses. Now it's time to see how those pieces are gonna look in the enclosure. You really wanna lay out how this tank is gonna look before we do anything permanent. And another thing to keep in mind, when we're working with an enclosure this big, I typically like to lay the enclosures on their back so that we don't have to work against gravity. However, this enclosure is really heavy and really big, and I don't feel comfortable leaning the enclosure back. It's not designed for that. So for a build this big, you have to think about gravity. And it's not like gravity just goes away once we're done building this. So I really find it important when you're working with enclosures this big that you think about gravity while you're setting this up. Now let's glove up and start using our foam. And please read the instructions on the bottle if you've never used this before. But it's foam time! This is where it really starts to get real and you really get to customize your enclosure. Now this foam kind of acts like concrete, but also glue that holds the pieces together, but also kind of a transitional piece between the glass and the wood. It really just starts to tie it all together. I start with the base of heavy pieces. So as you see here, I lifted up this basking spot and then set it down in the foam. But it is very important to keep in mind, this foam is going to expand two to three times how it looks when it comes out of this bottle. 
You do not need a lot, trust me. But again, it is important, keep in mind, gravity is acting against you. So I find it best, start with the base and then start to foam those areas where uh, different pieces connect. And this is 24 hours after I sprayed that foam. See how big it is? Then I had a great idea. I love using these seagrass hammock pieces in my Chuckwalla's enclosure, but she always rips the suction cups off the wall because, you know, she's a Chuckwalla. So I took one of my driftwood pieces that I knew I was going to have towards the top and I drilled two holes in it. So instead of relying on suction cups, I can just use some twine and tie the seagrass hammock directly into the driftwood. It was really easy though. Started with a small bit, went into a larger bit just so it wouldn't strip. Then I carved a little niche into this driftwood so it would sit nicely next to this already established piece. Cause again, gravity's working against me here. Then I found some other driftwood pieces to fill in this awkward space and then use the foam to fill in the other smaller awkwarder places. <laughs> and here's another example of how the foam allowed me to customize this area. Then I wanted to add this little corner spot for my chuck wallet to sit on some slate. So day two of foaming, I sprayed some of the leftover in there so that it could expand so that on day three, I could put some more foam in there and not have the foam expand so much that it like pops the top of the slate off. Then of course, filling in the different crevices and adding some driftwood. Then on day three, it was time to customize the background some more which can be very difficult because of gravity on this build. But I found making little mountains almost and then letting the foam drip and then replenishing the top actually worked really, really well. I then added some driftwood and some small slate pieces to make it not just foam. Now to let all the foam cure for at least 24 hours. Now you're looking at this foam right now and going, that does not look natural. And that's okay, it's not supposed to yet because you have to shave it down. The foam will naturally waterproof itself. That's what that card seal is on the outside. However, it doesn't look very good and the silicone can actually not stick onto that hardened foam, which is another reason why you have to shave it down besides it not looking realistic at all. This part can be very tedious and time consuming. However, it is incredibly satisfying. But this is usually the part where my arms are just burning because you're in really awkward positions trying to shave this foam. But once you're done, it's time to clean it up. I prefer a shop vac, but I didn't have a cord outside my balcony, so I had to use this vacuum. But either works, you just have to get all those little pieces of foam out and any debris that might have fallen off some of the driftwood. You need a clean base to start siliconing. Now it's time to seal and make it real. All the products I use in the build will be listed below, but this is the best silicone to use that's not like an aquarium silicone, which is double the price. Then you'll need a substrate of choice. And of course, our favorite, gloves. Then you'll just pop the silicone into the dispenser and get started. So how I like to go about siliconing is I will line the edge, fill the center in just a little bit, doesn't have to be completely full, and I'll just kind of mush it all together with my finger. I use my right hand glove to mush in the silicone, and then I use my left hand to push the substrate in. Then I grab a new glove for my right hand and just continue the process. But again, gravity is working against you. I particularly use this higher up piece to demonstrate what to do because it was kind of a perfect example. However, I had to vacuum up sand then to do the bottom parts. So when you're going to silicone with a tank that's standing upright like this build, start at the bottom because then it doesn't matter if more sand from the top gets put onto that silicone. It's already there. However, you don't want sand on the fresh foam. For the substrate, doesn't have to be sand, doesn't have to be rocks, etc. A lot of people just use Eco Earth, and I use that for all of my tropical builds. However, I wanted something that was a little bit more natural to my Chuckwalla's natural environment. And using sand in this way is actually really awesome for a diverse amount of animals because it's not loose, so they can't eat it. They can't ingest it because it's actually pushed into the sealant. So you can use this for bearded dragons to make it look more natural because they literally can't consume it. But really the main things when you're using the silicone to keep in mind is, you know, gravity's working against you, go from top to bottom. You're gonna go through a lot of gloves. Trust me, you don't wanna use the same silicone glove over and over again to mush it in because you're just gonna get it everywhere. And most importantly, why I was doing this outside on my balcony is because silicone smells so bad. It's like dying Easter eggs when you're a little kid, but 20 times worse. <laughs> 
So when you're using the silicone, please do it somewhere in a heavily ventilated place. Outside in your garage with both doors open, not inside, trust me, it's very strong. Then let it cure for 24 hours or until the smell is gone. And now for a backdrop. Now you could just make it black, but I like to make it fancy. For all of my enclosures, I actually use scrapbook paper on the outside of the glass enclosures. I decided to do a kind of desert sunset theme, so I just measured out how tall the enclosure is, divided it by the amount of colors that I had, and made a gradient. But you know, this build is somebody's home, so I decided to have the future homeowner go in and do an inspection real fast before I finished everything up. That's where your little hammock went. There's a little cave for you. Yeah, you see that? Uh oh. We're not gonna get her out of this. <laughs> you are so not graceful. Oh my god. Look at that. And real fast, this is how I tied the twine to set up this little hammock guy. And now we're on our last stage, finishing it off. Time to add that substrate in. I use the same sand soil substrate that I use for the backdrop, literally just a mixture of some sands and some soil. Added some oak leaves on top for a final touch. And now to make it bioactive. I added some powder blue and orange isopods and some springtails, and that's literally it. These guys are very resilient and can handle high temperatures. That's particularly why I picked the blue and orange powder isopods. And I mean, springtails are just everywhere. <laughs> These guys are gonna eat the waste and make your cleaning little to none. My guys like to hang out under the water bowls, so every once in a while I'll miss them a little bit just to give them some water. And for the final touch, this is Jada's original basking spot compared to her new one. She was that little once. Well, I think it's time for the big reveal. All right, moment of truth. You ready? Here you go. I am so incredibly happy with how this enclosure turned out, and this simply would not be possible without the amazing enclosure that I received from ReptiZoo. This 120 gallon or 48 by 24 by 24 inch large glass reptile terrarium simply just makes this entire build possible. Like I said before, you can't have a beautiful custom enclosure without a perfect base. Let alone with it being easy to build, it is so easy to take care of my Chakwala now. From a custom enclosure that is designed just for her and her needs, to the isopods that will take care of her waist, to the easy sliding doors giving me easy access to her food bowl and her easy access to running and jumping on me, it's simply perfect. When you start to build a custom enclosure, it's really important to know what your reptile needs. Obviously, I've owned my Chakwala for a while, so I know things she likes. For example, the seagrass. She loves to sleep on it, so I knew I wanted to incorporate it in. I also watched a video from Dave Kaufman. He went out and basically studied how Chakwalas live and how we should convert that to a captive enclosure. Doing lots of research on where your reptile originates from, what their natural environment is like, I think is very key to making a perfect custom enclosure. Then for the supplies I found from driftwood to the substrate, I simply go to a lot of reptile fairs, a lot of local reptile events. And I actually found that big basking spot at a local fish store. So going out to different reptile places, pet stores, fish stores, you name it, you're gonna find these incredible pieces and then you'll find a way to tie them all together. 
And as I filmed this voice recording, Jada has been living in this enclosure for a few days now and her energy has just spiked. She has been having such a good time. She's so much more herself. And it just really highlights that when you have a good enclosure, it's gonna reflect on your reptile's health and well-being. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you learned something today and I hope your reptile loves their new enclosure. Don't forget to check out RepTizoo to get the most amazing base enclosure for your custom builds. Obviously, mine looks great. Don't you want that in your home? And I think your reptile wants to make that their home. But thanks again for watching. Have a happy day. Goodbye.